I've done this. This is this is dating, right? Yeah. This is like going on a date. This is I'm trying to not reveal too much of myself, get in, get information from you to see, you know, to see how 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 we get along. You know, that's the whole dating process. ACNFers, it's CNF Pod. You know what that is? It's a creative nonfiction podcast, the show where I speak to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. I'm Brendan O'Mara. How's it going? Today's guest is someone I've long admired, long wanted to talk to. Just in the last episode, in episode 354, uh, Niall Capello, she said that for her, every story has a moment. So with Flinder Boyd, the moment is now. Because it's been 10 years since his legendary feature, 20 Minutes at Rucker Park, for SB Nation Longform, came out. You know, and it was edited by the equally legendary Glenn Stout, who Flinder brings up several times in this conversation. 20 Minutes made the cut for Best American Sports Writing in 2014, and let me tell you, it's every bit as good today as it was in 2013 when it published. I was editing a basketball profile for someone who had left a review for the podcast, and that's when it dawned on me that maybe to help this writer kind of crack the code, see what else, see what's possible. I shared Flinder's piece, and I read it again, and I was like, damn, that's good, and holy shit, it's been 10 years. Flinder is a former professional basketball player. He played in Europe and played against the likes of Ricky Rubio. And let me hit pause right there. Rubio is something of the butt of jokes here in the States uh, and the NBA. And Flinder recalls, albeit briefly, how superior a talent Rubio was to him. That feeling when you have reached the limits of your talent and your ambition, you know, he saw it firsthand while squaring off against Rubio. When someone like Rubio comes to the States and doesn't quite pan out, many people say, like, ah, he sucks. Well, yeah, what a bum. But you look out onto the field or the court, the pitch, those men and women at that level are from another fucking planet. Then when you get to the best of the best, you're looking at your Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady's, Aaron Donald's, Megan Rapinoe, Sue Bird, Kansas Parker, LeBron James, and they make fellow freaks look like mortals? Damn, like how good are they? I ran into that somewhat in on the baseball field, you know, to some extent. Like dudes who made contact with the ball and the ball just like warped off the bat and it sounded like you know, when I would feel the ball at shortstop and one of the balls would come off the bat and it sounded like a a, a beehive. It was just like and and it, then it hits your glove and you're like, "Holy shit, what was that?" And some of them you know, throw the ball, the sound it makes, the hiss, how heavy that ball is it's it's something special and when you're brushed up against it you're like yeah i'm not that good flinder wrote about that rubio experience and his playing as his playing days dwindled and he built a body of work based on unpaid spec pieces he had a knack for it and he reread pieces by the likes of jeff charlotte and dissected him he went to the game tape and he learned from glenn and Flinder is a special talent in, in this mess. So we talk about what these past 10 years have been like for him since Rucker Park came out. So stay tuned for my parting shot, announcing my book deal and what it's about and why I feel like I'm going to barf. You know, for now, why don't we just get right into it with the one and the only Flinder Boyd. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not doing this kind of writing as much these days, but i um, still doing a little sports writing. I'm, I'm getting more into documentaries and and really want to move into that field and and you know start producing, eventually directing. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of the next the next avenue. Um, and so I, I worked on some podcasts, doing some stuff like that. But man, I really miss. I kind of went back and read some of these old uh, long form articles. I really miss that stuff. Yeah, and was there um, a point where it just became like untenable to try to like keep doing that kind of reporting, and to and that's why you got away from it? Yeah, just 
I mean, a lot of places just didn't want it anymore. I mean, you remember the great like shift to video yeah, yeah. of whatever year, you know, 2017 or something where, you know, all these outlets thought video was the future and, you know, that didn't, that really didn't last that long. So, you know, writers were out of jobs and they weren't paying for the big freelance stuff anymore. And, and if they did, they wanted to own all the rights to them, which is a whole other conversation. So, yeah, just kind of like, I mean, it's really like over the course of a year, everything just kind of fell apart and all this stuff wasn't happening anymore. I mean, there when I got into the into the business, it was like the golden age of long form writing and especially long form sports writing. There was just so much amazing stuff coming out every day and so many great stories. And man, I mean, I, I miss it. so many great writers that I discovered and kind of got their career started during that, during that, that window. Yeah. It, it's hard to believe that it's been ten, like coming up on 10 years since the, your wonderful Rucker Park piece. And, you know, I re, it, it came across my radar again, cause I was just working with um, a, a young writer who ha- was working on a basketball profile. And uh, I was just thinking, I'm like, Oh, you know what? You know, I, I think it would help this, uh, this guy. If he, uh, if he read Flinders piece on Rucker Park, I sent it to him and it'd been a while since I read it. And I was just, you never know if certain things are going to hold up over time. And I read it again. I'm like, God, this piece is so good. And it just gets to the heart of like, I don't know, just chasing that American dream. And you just like, don't have the talent to, to pull it off. And it was just, and you knew it too, as you were following him and just given your basketball background, like you could tell. And it just, it's all the more, it's all the more sad and it still lands with such a such a gut punch and it's just a testament to your ability as a storyteller that it that it's hold, that it's held up so well over 10 years. Yeah, thanks man. I mean it's I mean it's, it's probably the story I love more than any other that I've done. I mean it's so meaningful and we kind of came at an interesting time in my life too where you know when I was going to New York with him on the on the bus, I just brought a couple bags and moved to New York, you know, <laughs> my, my life was kind of in flux as well. So it, it was really impactful for me. And it's interesting because I'm still in touch with TJ all the time. I hear from him, you know, he'll text me out of the blue constantly. So he's had a really interesting story over the last 10 years himself. And he, he, it's funny because right before you emailed, he called me. He said, man, 2023 is the 10 year anniversary of, of, you know, he says of my article, like we have to, we have to do something. We got to like celebrate or, or write a sequel or something, you know? (laughs) So it's, uh, I think, I think at the time I wasn't very hopeful that, you know, anything very good was going to happen to him, but it really is a testament to that, like, extreme belief in self even if you don't have the like talent or ability to back it up that he's kind of he's kind of made something of himself over these years yeah if you were to pen some sort of a thousand word epilogue you know how how would that start oh that's a good question I mean it would probably start you know and he'll be okay with me telling this because he wanted to he wanted to kind of get this get this stuff out there again you know get his get his sequel out again but you know it would start with he I was kind of on a vacation and then like Palm Springs and he called me out of the blue and he's like man I am I'm suicidal and I don't know what to do Mm -hmm. I need you to help me um and man I get emotional thinking about it because it was like he's kind of become like a little brother over these years you know Mm -hmm. which I never really never really imagined And I mean, it's also nearly impossible to find a therapist if you don't have money, you know, money to pay for like him. And, you know, that was that was a challenge in and of itself. But, you know, this is probably five, four or five years after the article came out, I got that call from him. He had kind of hit a hit a bottom. You know, one of his friends had committed suicide. He he found out he was a father of an eight year old kid that he had no idea back in Sacramento. Wow. Um, you know, his job had ended. He, he was in New York trying to, trying to do it. And he had always turned to basketball and he had got hurt. He had given up basketball and it was, he ended up taking up, um, running and he kind of became like a, (laughs) you know, a 
long distance runner and get up super early and start running and slowly his mental health started to improve and kind of to get things back on track. And, you know, he has this like little kid ability to get really excited about things that I think a lot of us would think aren't that cool anymore. You know, like he loves basketball cards and he'll call me and say, Oh, I got this new, like Anthony Hardaway, 1993. I can't believe it. It's incredible. You know? <laughs> and he, you know, he moved, he moved. So he went back to Sacramento uh, after the story and then ended up coming back to New York and trying his luck in New York. And he got a job at CVS in Manhattan and he thought it was like the, the greatest job in the world. And he got promoted and eventually that job ended. And about a year ago, as, as everything in his life is improving, he got a job at the World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center on the top floor as a security officer. And he'll send me these pictures of him on the top floor, you know, view of New York. And he'll be like, people don't know, but I have the greatest job in America. Like, this is the coolest thing in the world. This is my dream. I, I just stand here. I'm here for eight hours and I get to see New York and see the skyline. And I'm like, man, like, how cool that he's kind of like figured out how to have the life that he wants to have, you know, that's good for him. And he doesn't compare himself to to others or what other people think, you know, for me, if I'm, if I'm having a bad day and the writing's not going well, you know, sometimes I call him and he's like, man, my life's incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm at the world trade center and I have a new basketball card. And he has this like real boyish quality. That's, that's just contagious when you, when you start to talk to him. When you get into the, and I, I've talked about it frequently on the show, about that, that comparison mindset that I think is especially toxic in what we we do over, over the years, because it does, it always feels like, especially in a, in, when social media really glommed on about 10 years ago and has done nothing more to uh, improve, really improve the landscape, it's like you start seeing everyone everybody's successes and anthologizing this and then you're like man why why am i not getting that and you know i just feel like crap and it looks like they're killing it and it sounds like that's something that you know it's something i wrestle with almost on the daily uh, but it sounds like something you wrestle with time to time as well oh absolutely man i mean i had to get off social media pretty much for a long time just because there just wasn't a lot of good coming out of it for me it wasn't like adding a lot of value and you do get into that place of, Oh, why haven't I done this or that? And, and yeah, absolutely. You know, I went, I kind of, I guess going, if we're going way back, you know, I used to play pro basketball for a lot of years. And when that ended, this is back in 2012, beginning of 2012, um, you know, I went through like a, months of just deep depression, not knowing what to do with my life. What am I going to do? You know, all that value you get from being an athlete and looking at the, your stats and people telling you you're doing great or people telling you you're doing terrible and these <laughs> extreme highs and lows you get that kind of define your life. You know, you don't really have that anymore. You don't even have like a game on the weekend to look forward to or a season or everything kind of starts to unravel. So it took me a while to really like find the next thing and writing was kind of the next thing. And it gave me a lot of those like competitive juices. I'd get playing and, and telling somebody's story. And I would, I would almost be able to tell my story through this person. And there was just so many great things I got out of it. And then kind of the same thing happened when, as what we were talking about earlier, you know, when that long form world, kind of collapsed I went back to this well what do I do now like how do I find that value in myself if I'm not getting this hit and just learning over the last few years how to actually like not rely on my my job and work and you know whether I was a basketball player writer or whatever it is to constantly seek that validation like from somebody else because that's I mean, in social media, it's just, it's constant. It's constant. How many likes did I get? How many retweets? What do people say? What's going on? And then when you see somebody like TJ, who doesn't really have that at all, you know, he's, he doesn't really compare himself to anybody. He's, he's very much his own person. He, he has his challenges, no question, but he has like these passions that he loves that are just for him. 
He doesn't care what anybody thinks. He has his job that he loves that's just for him. You know, and it's really it's really inspiring in some ways, you know, to have that kind of person in my life that I, I can look I can look towards. You mentioning that TJ found running and, and running, I feel, is a sport that saves a lot of people. And not that TJ's addicted to anything, but a lot of addictive personalities are drawn to running because they get a similar buzz, but it's certainly not as uh, not as toxic. And it, it, did you just get a sense in talking to him that like, you know, and also just intellectualizing the sport of running, like that there is just something akin to that sport that is that can save someone's life? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I never would have pegged TJ as somebody who would have taken up running. You know, yeah. it just he didn't really seem like that kind of person. But I think for him, there was something very meditative about it. You know, his mind is like going a million miles an hour and he can just get in the zone and run. And I think running kind of has that therapeutic quality where you can just get in the zone and just stay in the zone for as long as you can do it. And you know, everything kind of floats away, you know, especially people who are very like analytical and in their mind a lot for sure, or addictive, addictive personalities, as you say, like for me, it's not something I've ever really been able to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I read, I've read some, some books on running and I think it's just, it's really fascinating too, how people push their bodies through running and that, that constant, need to like get to the next level and get to the next level and get to the next level. I find, I find very fascinating and interesting in a lot of parallels to athletes in general, you know. When your basketball career came to an end and you were kind of in that funk and um, something I can kind of relate to too, uh, I, I never reached the heights of baseball that you reached in basketball, but when I was cut from my college team, so I would have been 20 at the time. So this was in, 2000 and um it was weird this you had this thing that you know, had a you're very regimented or your life was dictated by it, and then all of a sudden it's gone and i similarly was just rudderless and geez even sometimes i feel like the last 20 years have been in some way rudderless as a result of not having the the, the focus that sports gave me um but it, you know you you mentioned that you were you were in a bit of a funk so how did you come to to writing and how did writing start to pull you out of it I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, you're, you're really losing your, your identity, like your core sense of self, who you are, you know, like who I was like a basketball player and an athlete from the time I was like six years old, you know? And when that goes away, you, you're like stripping yourself down to its core. Like, who am I? What is my purpose? What do I do? You know, and there's really nothing more powerful than, than your identity and your sense of self, you know, everything is kind of wrapped around that. And I think we're constantly on this quest to like find our, our, our sense of self. And for me, it kind of even started before I stopped playing. I was, I, I got hurt for like six months and I was living with a girlfriend at the time. And I just started to write kind of my funny stories from playing basketball. She said, Oh, stop telling me these stories. Just go write them down. <laughs> so I ended up actually just writing a book of like a fictionalized version of my first year playing in France. And it's just in the back of a closet somewhere. But I love the process of writing a chapter, going back, editing it, writing it again, editing it. You know, it was just really exhilarating. I started a little blog I did out there. And then when I finished playing, I didn't know that, you know, writing could be like a career or sports writing or I didn't know about any of that. And there was this old website called The Classical, great web website, David Roth website. And um, they had this, this segment where they talked about different players. Every writer would write about their favorite player and something interesting about them and incredible writers who wrote for them. And so I wrote one about Ricky Rubio and I played against Ricky Rubio in Spain. And it was kind of this like Mozart versus Scalieri or Salieri, I guess his name, and um, and that I could never get to his level. He was just on this completely different plane. And I loved, I loved the process. You know, I did seven, eight drafts, you know, didn't get paid for it. Loved the process, loved, loved the editing process. And I was just hooked. I was really into it. And people kind of got into it and 
from there, I was like, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. How do I actually do this? And I didn't have any idea. So I wrote another article for free and another one and another one. And finally, Glenn Stout, you know, asked me to write something for his, for his website, old SB Nation. And then I was a writer and that's just, that's just kind of how it happened. I almost stumbled into it, but it gave me something to like hang my hat on, gave me something that I could like wake up and look forward to and think about these stories and how do I tell them. And, and I love the process of like the reporting and meeting somebody and getting them to tell me their story, you know, and people were just so eager to tell their story. And I felt like I got almost something almost therapeutic on my end, moving through, you know, from my, my basketball phase into the writing <laughs> phase, hearing people's stories and, and then being able to write them down and almost like tell a piece of my own story. So it was great, man. It's, a, it's an interesting, interesting time in my life for sure. Yeah, I I love that you you don't have the the traditional path to this, and I think it's really inspiring that you know if you just approach it with curiosity and just kind of a love for the process that you that you can you can make something beautiful and make some beautiful art. Like whether you can whether any of us can like make a living doing it anymore is a different topic for an, another day. Uh, but it but it seems like it really stemmed from you know, your, your curiosity and, and just a willingness to kind of slog your way through the work. And, and, and that's how you started to build a body of work. And that was your resume, not where you went to college and a connection you made. It was just like, I'm going to make this. And it, it stood on its own and, and it got noticed just based on the sheer, sheer, uh, you know, rigor and your willingness to do the work, even if you weren't getting paid for it at the time. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said about, you know, having passion for something. Yeah. You know, because I didn't have that background, like you said, but I, I loved it. You know, I would read articles all the time. And if there was one I liked, I would just sit and read it over and over. Mm. You know, how did he do this transition here? How did he structure it like that? You know, that's really interesting the way he used these quotes or whoever it is. I mean, there was, you know, somebody I really, I really loved reading was Jeff Charlotte, great writer. And, you know, a couple of those articles, I would just read over and over and over how he how he was able to do that and structure things. But there were so many great writers. I always it always makes me sad now when I see people on Twitter, or other people say like, what, what do you what do I tell young writers when they ask me what they should do or young journalists? I say, find another profession, you know, <laughs> and I think that's kind of sad because if you're really passionate about it and it's really what you want to do, you know. Why not figure it out? Why not find the path that's going to work for you? I, I love hearing you say that you would reread uh, these pieces and try to see things different way. It's kind of like to use a sport metaphor that I, I that I like is like going to the game tape and like go go there mm -hmm. and you rewind, watch it again, rewind, watch. Okay, I'm starting to see things now. And uh, it took me a long time to read as a writer, and I wonder, like for you, like how did that switch? turn on for you where you were starting to see the structure and see the architecture of a piece and yeah, be able to deconstruct it. Yeah. It happened. It was Glenn Stout, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, he was like a huge mentor for me. I think this Rucker Park was probably the third piece I wrote for him, but the first one I wrote about, uh, you know, uh, Chris Copeland, who was a 29 year old rookie with the New York Knicks. And his journey, I had played with him in Europe and his journey. And I remember, you know, as we were going through that process, I would call him and it was like, you know, taking a grad level course in long form writing. You know, he would walk me through how structure works, how this might work. Go read this article, go read that article. And it was like a light bulb went off like, man, this is incredible. Like putting all these pieces together of the puzzle so that this piece can flow the way it flows and feel the way I want it to feel. And, you know, there was this like poetry to it and cinematic element. Like it was just, it was beautiful. And I learned so much from him really. And also kind of how to, how to think about writing and how to think about long form writing, you know, even something as simple as, you know, read it out loud to yourself two times before you, 
you know, send it to the next round, send it to the editor, see how it sounds. How does it flow? Does it sound right to you? You know, even stuff as simple as that. I've been, you know, really valuable. And when you're, you know, reporting and interviewing and getting into that phase uh, of things, uh, to what extent do you prep for an interview versus, you know, leaving yourself just completely open to how the conversation will go and then just kind of, you know, kind of read the conversation versus steering it with whatever prep you might have done? You know, it's interesting, like, and when I first started, I would have put my recorder down, you know, this is in person and I just put my recorder down. I'd have my notebook out. I'd have all my questions and I'd start interviewing them and it just would come across a little awkward and they'd be glancing down at my notebook as I was writing or glancing down at my notes and there, it wasn't very fluid. So I stopped doing that. You know, I just put my phone down, record. I wouldn't bring a notebook. I wouldn't bring any notes. I generally wouldn't even prep, you know, I just have a basic idea of what I wanted to talk about. And then it started to flow a lot more naturally. And I, and I began to see, Oh, I know this, like I've done this. This is, this is dating, right? Yeah. This is like going on a date. This is, <laughs> I'm trying to not reveal too much of myself, get in, get information from you to see, you know, to see how, how, how we get along, you know, that's the whole dating process. Um, and so it became a lot more, a lot more fluid for me in doing that. And I began to have like, you know, just better, better relationships during that interview process where we could kind of bounce off each other a little bit and really getting to the heart of rather than saying, okay, they need to, answer these specific questions it was like sometimes they would take me on a path that I never even expected tell me about stuff I never even expected you know and then start to get closer to the heart of actually what I wanted to write about the key though was always to leave it and say hey, is it okay if I call you if I have more questions right yeah yeah because there's always stuff that's going to come up always stuff you forgot to say as you do more reporting, new things are going to come up, you know, and then you've kind of built that rapport because you had this like nice fluid conversation where you can call and say, Hey, what about this other thing? Um, and that's really when you get the good stuff is that second or third time you talk to them. That's such a good point too. Cause as you're talking to them and you might, they might say something like, and in, in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, that's that's pretty juicy. I, I want to talk about that. But if you interrupt them and and uh, and try to get them to unpack that, you can like derail things. So it's always great. Like you go back and be like there are there are moments where you like feel like you should in the moment follow up. But then there are like, oh, mm-hmm. that's something I definitely want to circle back to. But you don't want to you know, like totally derail the conversation. So it's like, yeah, if you can get back to that second or third conversation, you can really get super granular and just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And even I just think, you know, I just think it's like treating, you know, the people you interview as as like human beings, you know? Yeah. Maybe there's stuff you just you just don't broach and you're not going to get that information. And that's just what it is. I, I, you know, kind of makes me cringe when I hear journalists talk about their quote unquote subjects. You know, mm, yeah. like these aren't, these aren't lab rats. These aren't people who were just like extracting information from them at all costs. You know, there's a certain human element. Um, and I think it's really important to, to remember that as, as, as we do that, as we do this. Yeah. Speaking of a human element, I'm just thinking of, you know, of TJ and Rucker Park, you know, there are, there's like moments too, where just from a pure uh, basketball perspective and even like maybe even in a, in a slightly character way, you know, you, you do land, you know, certain judgments and even some, some pity. And it's, uh, it, at the time it can come across as, as harsh. I imagine for him, maybe it would be like hard to read, be like, Oh, Flinter, like you know, he made that assertion, which you could, cause you had the authority to. And I wonder for you, just given that human element, like, what's the challenge for you in sometimes making that assertion on the page, even if it might be a little hurtful? 
Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, because you you do build a relationship with somebody, yeah. you know, especially if you're if you're writing about them, right? You're writing it. I mean, the whole thing's about TJ and his journey. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a there's there is a back and forth and there's a challenge with it. And I think editors can help with that, but ultimately it's just a feel. Does does this feel like I'm saying the truth and I'm saying it in a way that isn't going to destroy somebody? Because, you know, when that article did come out, TJ was, you know, he was pretty hurt by it. He, you know, and I think a lot of people, if you, when they read something about themselves can feel a little shocking. And I think he's still, it, the thing that was the most hurtful was reading that he wasn't very good at basketball. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, that was his entire identity was he had built, he had built this, this persona of this great basketball player. But I felt like I was not just telling the truth, but telling the truth of TJ's story and who TJ actually is. And I think if you're getting to that place of, if you're actually telling who this person is, you know, then I, then I think you're okay. And obviously our relationship is great now because there was that like honesty that I had and that he had with me. But I mean, I think I can even give you another example. I did this story about Joe McKnight about five years ago. Joe McKnight was like a great football player who died in a road rage killing. Mm. And, you know, I talked to his family and his family wanted me to write the story and I really struggled with how to talk about his relationship with his mom, right? Because it was so central to who he was. And it was it was a challenging relationship. So I went back and forth and back and forth. And I ended up kind of really smoothing it over, but doing it in a way that showed that they didn't have a very good relationship. And I think when this came out, when that came out, you know, his sister and his mom weren't very happy that I had put that in at all. And I, and I understood that. And I had to really like, look at that, whether that was worth it and whether it was necessary to do that or not do that. And I, it took me, you know, I I processed that for a long time and I, and I came to the conclusion that to really tell the story of who he is, that had to be in there. And ultimately like his legacy and who he is, 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 is important right? I think he is the person he is because of that relationship with his mom. And over time, you know, I'm actually now cool with his sister. And we talk from time to time and she, you know, has has even wanted me to do a follow-up on that. So I think she saw too how important that was to to the article. But man, it's, it's, it's challenging and you really have to grapple with it. And I don't think anything is is just like this idea that I have to tell the quote unquote truth at all costs. I mean, you really have to just have some empathy and feel like what's right and what's not. And also it, uh, circling back to, you know, interviewing as techni- technique and skill, you know, there's obviously interviewing for information, uh, but there's also interviewing for scene. And that's so an integral to uh, the work that the work that you've done is if you're not on the scene too. So it just uh, maybe you can delineate between between the two and how you how you approach you know interviewing and building scene when when you're not on the scene. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I think it's it's kind of what I was talking about before, where I think you get a lot of that great scene stuff the second or third time you talk to somebody, you know, because you I'm trying to get a full picture of what is actually happening the first time, who's involved, what's going on. And then if I talk to them again, I can say, well, what happened in this situation? You know, and they'll say, well, X, Y, and Z happened. Okay. But walk me through it. Like you're like, you're like, you know, like I'm not there. Tell me exactly what happened. Okay. This happened and that happened. Okay. And then when that happened, what happened with that? You know, I think it's like really wanting to get these little details. And and I think most people really want to talk about that stuff. There was, I had this fear in the beginning, like, am I pushing too hard? Are they getting annoyed that I'm like asking these little Mm -hmm. details about this event that seems maybe to them, maybe insignificant, right? Are they, does this bother them? Um, There's that fear that kind of pops up. 
you know, because we're all human, right? We all like this need to want to still want to be liked even by the person who anybody we're speaking to, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, but I think, I think like, I, I realized they get really excited by that. They want to tell these little details. They want to tell these moments in their life that have just kind of passed. And now all of a sudden this random person reporter is coming in and they think it's important and they want to talk about it, you know? So I was always amazed at how, how willing people were to share, share their story. It's like, for some people, it's like they've been waiting their whole life to share this story or to share this little anecdote about this other person or to share, you know, they they get really jazzed and by it. And I kind of feed off that. And then, and then we're kind of doing this dance where we're getting deeper and deeper. And there's so much excitement. I mean, I love that part of it. I absolutely love that part. Um, and that connection you have with other people and just hearing their stories. I think it's great. Yeah. When I was reading uh, Robert Caro's uh, memoir on writing, uh, just called Working, um, his big thing was, and t- getting to the scene building thing, is like, if I were standing right bus- right behind you, like, what would I be seeing? And mm. he would constantly like rep- like bang them over the head with that, like over and over again, mm. if they weren't being more forthright with the details, you'd be like, all right, but I'm right there. I'm right behind you. Like, tell me everything you see, like everything you're seeing. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it can be some, some of those, some some people might think certain details just don't matter, but it's just like, well, Mm -hmm. you know, was it, was it windy? What was, what was the temperature? Did you see your breath coming out of your mouth? You know, these little things that maybe if we were on the scene, we could take little notes about that, but it's, uh, getting him nudging him in that direction is it, it can be a bit of a challenge and i think they can kind of get annoyed but at the same time once they get going and the momentum starts building like you were just saying like it just starts spilling out and it can just be so fruitful and really fun because you see the the polaroid picture coming into development totally totally i mean i i remember one of that article i was just telling you about it, joe mcknight and i was asking his his mentor he had a meeting with joe and, you know, we were talking about this meeting and I said, you know, what, what did you eat? He said, oh, I had this steak. It was it was like well done or whatever. And, you know, it was lightly salted. And then we had this drink and it was on my left hand. Side. And I was like, man, this is so cool. He's like, <laughs> I felt like I was in the room with them. And some of that stuff made it in. I remember I was like, OK, they had a they sat down. He had a steak, medium rare. Or, or well done, you know, and maybe nobody even noticed, but for me, I was like, that is the coolest little detail to get in there, you know? And I think, and I, I think sometimes even as readers, we don't really even notice, but it just, it sucks us into the story. Uh, I read something a while back where a detective had picked up her coffee and it was, uh, you know, with, with a, splash of milk and i was like man what a great little detail just kind of puts me in her office already you can smell it you know you smell it you see it you taste it it's all it's all right there yeah it it kind of gets to the just hearing you talk about that too and how to really develop like just a really in nonfiction, it can be so challenging but like what you're saying you're really appealing to the senses and that can just really paint a picture, the smells, the tastes. It really puts a reader right there. Yeah. And I think, you know, you almost have to think of it cinematically. You know, if, if this was, we were sitting and watching this, what is, what does it look like? What is it, what is it, what does it do? What does it do to us? Um, and how does it, how does it stimulate us, stimulate our senses I mean, I love that stuff. And, and the colors, what is what is the colors? What was on the wall? I mean, the TJ article, I remember the piece when I walked into his room in Sacramento and he had these this Jordan cutout and Rajon Rondo's picture and his jersey and the music that was coming out of his headphones. And, you know, what is it, what does that all feel like and look like? And that's, the right, and sometimes that takes multiple drafts to really get to that place where it starts to click for us as writers. And what does it all feel like? And man, but that is, that's the good stuff. That really is the good stuff. That's the stuff I love. Yeah. And there's something that uh, to this day, and I'll probably never 
get over it. I have like a tremendous amount of anxiety around uh, cold calling. And especially if I, if there's no soft intro, be it an email or a text, when you know, like, you know, you're placing this call, someone gave you a phone number to go call someone and, and you just gotta, you gotta make that call and you gotta, your, your, your foreign phone number is going to come across their caller ID and they're, if they even pick up, it's going to be like, all right, this is who I am. This is how I got the number. This is why I want to talk to you. That that shit just makes me so anxious, and I wonder, <laughs> I wonder for you if you have any uh, cold calling anxiety, and if if you do, how you work with it, and if you don't, uh, just you know what that experience is like for you. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, yeah, I I have a lot of anxiety around that. I mean, especially <laughs> if it's somebody that you really need for the story, right? And you're really open to talk to, and you're like, man, this is not going to go good. Like, how do I, <laughs> how do I even approach this? Like, is do I have a backup plan? Like what's going on here? I don't think there's necessarily an easy way to do it. I think I have to, I think sometimes I often have to write down a script that I'm going to say as soon as I pick up the phone. So I'm not just there stuttering and right. mumbling through what's going on. You know, I think the like, the, the more clear you are about what you're asking for and how to set that up, the more likely you're going to get it. I think in the beginning, there was a lot of like, oh, if I'm really nice and 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 they like me, then they'll want to talk to me, you know, th- that type of stuff. And I think as you get older and you do it a lot more, it's there's the the power of clarity and just being really clear about what you're asking for. Um, these are the times we can do it. Let me know what works. And I think people respond a lot better to that. Yeah. I, sometimes when I, when I do that too, and I'm, I, I try to be as quick as possible. I'm like, listen, I know I'm probably, I'm catching you flat footed. We don't have to do this now. If you're open to it, let's set up a time that's like, feels good for you. And, um, I feel like sometimes that, that their hackles go down a little bit. Like, why the hell you're calling me? Who the hell are you? I haven't mm-hmm. even seen your face. Like you're just this random in my case, a North Carolina phone number, you know, coming across mm-hmm. and yeah, I live in Oregon now. So it's like, they're like, where are you? Where, who are you? Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. And so like kind of de- defraying it a little bit, be like, listen, we get, I, this is who I am, what I want to talk about. Don't have to do it now. I, I write right. a script too. Like I'll, I'll have it in a Google doc <laughs> and I'll be right there. So nice and short and punchy little bullet points. So I, so I'm mindful of time and mindful of my, my own anxiety. Right, it's, right. It definitely it helps me out. And it's, uh, but yeah, that's, that, that, that's helped me anyway. Well, I think the thing is like, sometimes, you, you know, we have to like turn it around and, and if somebody just called me out of the blue, like how would I respond? And yeah, I think I have to remember is for, I think me personally, and most people are like, there's always going to be a little bit of curiosity about, what do they want to talk about? Why do they want to talk to me? What's going on? You know? And, and so remember that, you know, a lot of people are actually think might not want to talk to you probably have some curiosity and want to talk more and figure out what, what's going on. So, you know, we can always, we can always use that. And, uh, you know, given that it's, I keep bringing up the 10 years since Rucker Park, you know, in the, the inner intervening years, like you alluded to it earlier, how there was that, pivot to video and thing for the, for the writers among us, the kind of the floor fell out from, from under you. Um, so what have the intervening years, you know, been like for you as a creative person, as a writer and as like kind of a you know, documentary filmmaker now? Yeah, I think it's, it's been a bit of a shift to try and figure out, I mean, you know, to be a storyteller, right? Cause it's ultimately, if you're doing creative nonfiction, you're, you're a storyteller how to do that and shift it into a different medium is a bit of a challenge, you know, and I went through a bit of a like existential crisis of, of, well, what do I do now? You know, and I just had to start a new career and now what am I going to do? You know, for a while I was like, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get my PhD and be a professor. And then I could just have an office and, you know, write books and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think ultimately, you know, my heart is in this and this is what I, what I wanted to do. But it's it's been a bit of a challenge. I think always in the back of my mind, documentaries has been kind of the path I wanted to take. But it's a completely different world getting into the Hollywood world and meeting meeting people and having those meetings and seeing how people operate has been a bit of a learning curve. 
So it's it's been exciting. It's been challenging. I I did a podcast for you know Audible, kind of a true crime podcast, which was great. I got to spend you know two months in Canada interviewing people, and a lot of the stuff we're talking about translates very well to different mediums. So that was good. And and now I've got a bunch of documentaries, a lot of sports stuff that I'm developing and really excited about. Yeah, but it's been it's been a transition. And, and I'll say I, I really miss the writing. You know, I've been doing kind of shifting to still doing long form writing, but not actually publishing it so I can own the rights. So I have like a stack of long form stuff I've done uh, just because I've been wanting to do it and think it's important. Uh, especially during the pandemic, I got into these great historical American stories that hadn't been told that I really wanted to tell. So that was a lot of fun to kind of dig into that and learn a lot about America at different points in history. But I think, you know, I'm learning, you know, being a storyteller, it's just always being able to be, you know, shift with the times and, and do different stuff. And so, so that's kind of where I am now. Yeah. And, Maybe, you know, what are some, you know, lessons you've learned that you're, you know, that, you know, from the last you know, 10 years or so that you're looking to sort of parlay into the next phase and maybe the next 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question. Man, tons of lessons. I mean, tons. It's funny, really, to think back 10 years, like when I started this, when when, when Rucker Park came out. And I was pretty naive about writing and journalism. And it was just something that was really calling me, something that I really wanted to do. And then to think now, like, what's transpired? In some ways, it's like a lot has happened in 10 years. And not that much has happened in 10 years. Like, 10 years goes by pretty quickly, right? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, certainly, I think following your passion and following that thing that really speaks to you is a big lesson for me um, because I think like when you do that, it, it is going to work out one way or the other and learning to be really clear with people, learning to be really clear with yourself. You know, a lot of stuff I learned from doing interviews with people or, you know, the whole writing process and the editing process and putting your head down and just getting it done and letting go of some of that perfectionism was probably, it's probably a, one of the biggest things really. I think as, as writers, it's like, oh, we got to, it's got to be perfect. I got to do that 15 drafts until it's perfect. And, you know, you kind of make yourself crazy and learning, learning to let go sometimes and say, Hey, this is good. It's not perfect, but it's good. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I think, honestly, that's probably one of the biggest lessons I learned. Yeah. That's, uh, that's so, so key. And I, I, you know, uh, something I talk about a a lot is uh, this ethos from Seth Godin, who, you know, he talks about how, you know, writer's block is a myth because what people really have a problem with is writing bad. Because mm-hmm. if you write enough bad stuff, eventually good stuff has no choice but to bubble up. But you just have to be comfortable writing a lot of bad, mediocre things. And that's, I think, the testament to writers with perseverance. Uh, like I'm sure even I'm right. Thompson's early drafts, I'm sure they're not that great, but he has good editor and he has rigor. And he just works through it and works through it and works through it. And then we get these amazing profiles that we've come to revere. So is that right. something you've right. learned over the years too? just kind of like lower that barrier of entry or that the perfectionism early on. And then you can really, yeah, you can turn, you can really uh, turn the screws and get something pretty damn good in the end. hundred percent. I mean, I, part of that has to do with your relationship with your editor. You know, you know, when I worked with somebody like, like Glenn Stout or some editor, other editors and, we're willing to do multiple drafts, then I think I would feel a little more comfortable turning a first draft that wasn't amazing, wasn't great, was just, I I got it done. And knowing we're going to get it to a place that feels good. You know, other editors, you know, when I was on staff, you know, other other places, Bleach Report, for instance, like, you know, they want a pretty clean first draft. We're going to do one more draft and that's it. Um, and that's when the like perfectionism would really kick in, like, oh my God, it's got like, um, and then my brain would start like melting and, you know, I'm overthinking and I'm rewriting 10 times. And, 
you know, I'm, I'm questioning myself and all this other stuff starts coming up and, you know, learning to let that go a little bit, learning to just put it down and say, okay, this is, this is good. I'm okay. And in doing that, then your first draft is going to end up being a lot better, but so much of it, I, you know, I remember talking to Glenn Stout early on about this and saying, you know, well, you know, how, how do I get around this? How do I deal with some of this anxiety that comes up around trying to get this right and get this perfect? He said, listen, the only advice I can give you is ass and chair. Like, <laughs> and, and I was like, what does that mean? He means just sit down every day and write, just write, you know, and you'll get better at it. It'll get easier and you'll be fine. Like there's, there's, there's really no shortcut. There's no like magic pill I can give you. That's going to make this, make this be easier. So, you know, I've tried to take that advice and I think that's a key. I think as a writer, often I want to feel great and feel like everything's good and I'm in a great mood and then I can sit down and write something amazing and learning to write when I don't really feel that great. Don't really want to write, you know, not, not feeling amazing. That is, has been kind of a big lesson for me and something that's really helped me. And one of the first conversations I ever had with Glenn, he, it was great. Cause he was just like, he's like, Brendan, nothing about this game makes any sense. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, all we can control is our effort and everything else is so out of our control. So it's, it goes right back to the ass yeah. and share thing. It's like, just work on your, you just work on the thing you're working on, work on your, uh, on your scales. If you're like a guitar player, like just that's all you can control. And then you do that long enough. It's just like, you just surrender to that process. And typically, you know, if you persevere long enough, good, good things will start to happen. hundred percent. I believe that, especially if you're, you know, if you're passionate about it and it's what you want to do, you know, you'll get better at it. Um, but I think that's kind of the, that's the trick though, is sometimes you read writers, I'll read, you know, great writers I admire and I'll be like, how the hell did they write this? Like, how did they, yeah. cause in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, he just sat down or she just sat down and wrote this and man, like I, they're genius. I'll never be on that level. But of course, like it's, it's drafts and drafts and drafts and thinking about it and thinking, uh, and getting to that place. And a, a, a while ago, you had you had emailed me too about you know certain things that deal with uh, IP and stuff you've written. So you know what has been some of the experiences that you've wrestled with with a piece you've written, be it on spec that might be unpublished, and and IP and things getting rug getting pulled out from under you and stuff of that nature. I'd love to you know hear your experience with that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky world, right? Because I think in the old days, what happened, and IP obviously is intellectual property, like in the old days was when you would write something, generally you would own that piece or you could negotiate to own that piece after 30 days or 90 days. And then if you wanted to take it and option it to film producer, you could do that and you would get the money from that, right? And then as the industry kind of collapsed, a lot of the outlets said, well, no, actually we're going to own the rights. We're going to own at least 50% of the rights. And, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to own these rights, which is really tricky, especially if you're not getting paid very much to, to write it in the, in the first place. And it really kind of changed the whole, the game, really. It changed everything because some of the journalistic rules that we abide by kind of went out the window. Right. And I think for a while I was still trying to abide by some of these like journalistic rules about, you know, separating those rights from when it would become a film and doing things the right way as a journalist. And then I think when I found out that some place, some places like Texas Monthly, which is revered, you know, they have their own agent in Hollywood, which is taking their own pieces and optioning them. Right. So that they're editing them in a way that's going to make them the most money and turn it into a film. Right. Mm. It really changed how I viewed that world completely, you know, because that that's not journalistic at all. Right. So instead of now taking it to an outlet and having them own it, I started to just take a piece, fund it myself, write it and then take it straight to film producers where I'd own all the rights. 
that being said, it's a messy process, right? Because you're missing some of the steps. I would hire an editor and I would fact check it, but you're still missing some of those steps journalistically, right? So it's a tricky world, right? There isn't really like a, an easy answer to this. Um, so what happened to me recently was I found this incredible story about the first women's soccer team that uh, girls of soccer team, they were a high school soccer team that played in the first FIFA international women's tournament in 1984 because there was no U S women's soccer team. And they played against the best women in the world of any age. And they, they won the tournament. Incredible kind of miracle on ice story. So I wrote that article. It took me like nine months, flew to Dallas, interviewed everybody, wrote the article and then optioned that. And then that, was going to become a movie and Matthew McConaughey was going to play the lead. The script was done two weeks before it was going to get made. It, it imploded. There was a question about some impropriety was one of the characters in the, in the story that Matthew McConaughey was going to play and going back to the eighties. And so they, so they shut the whole movie down, which I'm still not exactly sure what happened. You know, then there was some questions about, if would I have found this out, what would have happened if I would have gone through an outlet? I don't think so because, you know, I interviewed 20 people, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what if it, what if it came out? What if it was, you know, on the website, for instance, and somebody wrote a comment down at the bottom? Yeah, maybe. But I think it's a really interesting conversation overall about IP and how as journalists we deal with that because, you know, it's not really a level playing field for us anymore. These outlets, they they want to own so much of those rights, even if we're the ones, you know, writing it and finding the people and so on. And then there's this other side to it is if you want to write it yourself or write it through uh, a, an outlet, for instance, then you also want to attach the life rights to the subject you're writing about. You know, how does that work? Because before you wouldn't get the life rights while you're writing the article because there's a conflict of interest, right? Hmm. But outlets started to get scoop up the life rights while you were writing it, which is very unjournalistic, right? Yeah. So now authors had to go, or journalists had to go try and get those life rights while they're writing it. So it just, it gets messy, man. It gets it gets really messy and, and it's, it's kind of created like this weird, this weird world, um, which kind of goes against a lot of the stuff we learned about in, in doing this, these long form pieces. So it's a little bit of, of the wild west in that sense, but I do think for all journalists, it's important to, to own those rights. I would never, never advocate anybody giving up those rights, even, a, even a little bit of them. Like you can, you can publish things on your own website at this point. Right. Yeah. And then the, it becomes tricky to, you know, lobby, you know, people to come forward with stories and to trust you when you're like, ah, I'm just kind of doing this for myself versus like having the institutional backing of a bigger magazine or a website, which gives you authority and, and gives them some like a little status bump. It's just like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm talking to a guy from the new york times isn't that great instead sure. of like i'm talking to uh this freelancer who has no idea what he's going to do with the piece and it's like one one carries a lot more weight and will you know get more get you the access you want sure i mean absolutely absolutely i mean i now if i'm doing one i'll be just honest like hey i'm writing this to, to option to turn into a movie so you know i think i think some people still get excited about that. Yeah. Um, but I agree, you know, and it's just, yeah, it's kind of a sad way, kind of, you know, at this point, like there's certain places I would never write for because I would, I wouldn't want to give up all those rights, which is sad, you know, some great editors I'd love to work with and so on, but it's just the, the way of the business right now. So at, at this point, and I think I kind of have a, an idea, but I'd like to, you know, get a get a sense of where you know at, at this point like kind of where your ambition lies um yeah i think you probably have to 
ask a follow-up question in, in, in what sense i uh, just like where you you know what what's exciting you and where you want to take your writing your, your filmmaking like uh you know even you know when you were 30 or you know 10 years ago i'm sure you had a certain uh you know ambition that's getting published in various these places sb nation bleacher wherever and you know that those ambitions can kind of morph over time. So I wonder, just like where you see your, what excites you, and where you see yourself going, where you want to go. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I just really want to like just be a storyteller and get these stories out there. I mean, I want to. I think the big goal is I want to direct some some great sports documentaries. It's, I think that's kind of the the, the next ten year goal. Um, like 30 for 30 stuff like that kind of thing. yeah similar similar kind of stuff or you know whatever it's that yeah in that in that realm um i think that's kind of the next thing i i, I really want to kind of go for um an attack but i still want to do some you know long form writing and, and and exactly the way i was just talking about write stuff that could be option for film and you know, I still want to be able to do that because I, I, I just love that that process. Being able to interview somebody without a camera and without a bunch of like huge recording equipment. It's just a great, amazing process and experience that you can't really replicate, you know, replicate as as a, in a documentary or a podcast, you know. Yeah, there's an intimacy with just you and a person, your recorder, your notebook, and it's. It, it, it's a much more like a solo artist type thing, even though there is some collaboration editor and whatever, but it is so much more like intimate and the process is much more just in your hands in your hands alone. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you, and you actually get to build real relationships with people. You know, I think if you're interviewing somebody with a big camera, you're not really building a huge relationship in that way. I mean, look at me and TJ now, you know, we're he's like a little brother because we, we just were talking for hours and hours with just, you know, my phone in my pocket and that's mm-hmm. it. And there's just something really magical about that. So I think I'm always going to do that in some form, in some way, you know, even if I'm funding my own pieces, because I just, it's such a passion for me. Yeah. I almost liken it to you know, short story writers in, in fiction. It's like no one in their right mind is, uh, unless you're George Saunders or like, <laughs> is going to like make a, a living writing short stories. And so it's like, right. and I almost feel like long form journalism, the stuff that we're so drawn to is almost like that. It's like, you just got to treat it like, a, you know, a, the passion fiction project. And if you get a, get a few bucks for it, great. Otherwise you're, you're doing it for the love and for the art of it. Exactly. It's like being a poet, you know, at this yeah. point, it's like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's definitely, it's almost become like a niche audience too, that wants to, that wants to read those long form stuff, which is sad. I mean, you, we, you remember seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, this, there was, it was like the golden age for these long form articles. And there was a big audience and a lot of people read it and, you know, it's just, you don't really go on the internet to find you know, maybe, I mean, maybe you do, <laughs> but I think most people aren't going on the internet to find the the next great long form article. Well, very nice. Well, well, Flinder, the, as I like to bring these conversations down for a landing, I always ask the guests for a recommendation of some kind for the listener out there, and that can be anything from uh, some anything you're excited about, be it a pair of socks or a brand of coffee or a book or a movie. So, um, yeah, I'd ask, I'd extend that to you, Flinder. What what might you recommend for the listeners out there? Um, oh man, just what pops to my mind is, uh, I'm reading this book by Rebecca Solnit called Orwell's Roses, huh. which is really great. It's, she, she visited George Orwell's garden in the UK. And then she just writes a bunch of like little short chapters about roses and Orwell and goes on these wild tangents and it's just been a really fun ride. So I recommend it. Oh, she, yeah, she's amazing. I gotta, I gotta pick that up and read that. Um, awesome, man. Well, th- thank you so much for the time and for talking shop and getting a sense of what the, these intervening 10 years have been like. Uh, I, I look forward to this being what I hope is the first of many conversations that we have on mic or off mic. So I just want to thank you for the time. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks for having me on.
been listening to your show for a while, so exciting to, exciting to be here. Hey, thanks for listening, CNFers, and thanks to Flinder. I love writers who have non-traditional paths to long-form nonfiction. Sometimes I think the best of us, or the best, I won't say us, but I will say the best in this cluster of weirdos who do this kind of storytelling come, they don't, they didn't go to like a writing program or J school or anything. They just study at the, at the, at the feet of the masters. And that's what Flinder did. And he is definitively one of the masters in my humble opinion. If you like this conversation as much as I did, consider sharing it and tagging me in the show at CNF pod on Twitter and at creative nonfiction podcast on Instagram consider heading to patreon.com slash cnfpod and throw a few bucks into the tip jar show is free but it sure as hell ain't cheap and you can always rage against the algorithm with my up to 11 monthly newsletter by heading to brendanomero.com hey hey there you can also get show notes to this episode and a billion others some of you know via the rage against the algorithm newsletter twitter or instagram that it's a done deal done deal the official announcement Went out, I think, February, in the evening of February 1st on the day Tom Brady retired again. And I blasted it out on Groundhog Day, and the book proposal landed. And I got a deal in place with Mariner Books to write, wait for it, The Gift, Steve Prefontaine in the Dawn of the Modern Athlete. And the title comes from one of Pre's famous quotes, which is, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. So there you go. I went wide with it, you know, like I said, Feb- February 2, and I, I relished in the dopamine fix that was all the well wishes, and, and it felt good. You know, I know I rail against social media, and I often it often raises my hackles of resentment and jealousy and all that stuff that I talk about ad nauseum. But I put it out there because that's kind of what you do. It's what you got to do. To some extent, when you're on this level, you need to you need to broadcast it and celebrate it and be your own champion in that sense and bring it to the bring it to the people. And the outpouring, it just has been something like nothing I've ever experienced before. It felt real good to put out that publishers marketplace deal alert blurb. It's real sweet to see the support and how people believe in me and are happy for me in a way I didn't see coming at all. I know this little rush of of those likes and those retweets and those wonderful comments and I know it'll be short lived and it'll be, you know, back to the work, back to the cave to write the best goddamn book I can write about a big, big icon in track and field. And you know, I got a call from a friend, someone who's been on the pod a bunch of times, and she damn near made me cry. Like she was just so supportive and she was so excited. And so sweet. And she asked me how I felt. And I said, you know, panicked and, and nauseous. And she was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that that's kind of the deal. You know, as you wrote in my newsletter that came out uh, just a couple of days ago, February 1st, first of the month, no spam, can't beat it. This is one of the first times people expect something of me. You know, I wrote Six Weeks of Saratoga on spec. I kind of did that whole thing, and it uh, went to a small press and did okay for itself. But again, it was like I incurred the risk, and essentially that you know that w- that was it. it. It felt safe, and now with this book, I I have a a real nice advance, especially since it's spread out only like over a year and a half or so. Uh, it's more money than I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, when I saw the blurb that marketplace blurb and and then then I put it out there like my stomach dropped into my shoes and I haven't been able to eat all day which is probably good anyway you might think geez BR are you capable of feeling any joy and you'd be right to ask and yes I have googled how to have fun but there uh, there's a lot of pressure to stick the landing on this and I'm nervous in the way that you get pregame jitters and that's that's a good thing yeah I guess that's like the when you talk about distress and you stress, this is kind of the you stress. It's the stress of you you know you're pushing your limits and you're leveling up, I guess, is what you would say. Anytime I stepped into the batter's box, I was nervous and, if I'm being honest, a bit gassy. Uh, but you know you're in the right place. You know you're pushing yourself. 
my well of current sources for the pre-book. It feels nice. I can actually say what it is. You know, at this uh, nebulous book proposal and looking for sources about Steve Prefontaine. Look him up. But my current sources for the pre-book, is, it's kind of dry right now, and people haven't been calling me back. As a result, I've been saving hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles and coming up with more and more story beats that I hadn't even sketched out in my proposal. And I find that when that happens, like, oh, that's, oh, that's cool, that's nice, that's, that's the stuff that makes for a really good biography, those, those things that you can dredge up. And I find that my breathing starts to return to normal, and you see names in these articles. Nobody famous. They were just good high school runners. Maybe they ran in college. If they're running beside Pre and they're finishing within a few seconds of him, yeah, they probably ran in college too. And those are those are potential sources. And if they're still alive, and that's the thing too. A lot of these boomers are aging out, and they, you know, in their seventies. You know, not everyone makes it that far. And maybe you can find them and talk to them, see what that scene was like. A lot of a lot of dudes in these stories, I bet, haven't. There there are a few that have always talked about pre, and then there are a few who brush shoulders with them, but no one was doing any kind of digging to get to them. And then you find those cool things, and you're building that scene, and then suddenly you're one of the first ones to walk on the moon, and you're like on the rim of the sea, a sea of tranquility, and you're like, fuck. I I think I can do this. Uh, then you think about that, you know, that damn phone call you got from your pal and your eyes start to burn because you sense in her the possibility she and by extension others, you know, season you and it's almost too much to bear. Am I being a little melodramatic? Maybe. But it's been a long road, man. Like I'm lucky and I'm more than happy to share the good fortune and privilege that got me to this point. But I'll save that for another time. And sure, I've been at this for close to 20 years, knocking around this joint, hoping for a shot at big game. And it's here. And now i got to deliver. I've hit some pretty gnarly potholes already, like ones that like scrape the chassis, and you're like, fuck, can I sling, sling on a donut and keep moving? More on that to come. It's easy to feel alone in this mess, and for the first time in a long time, I feel less alone than ever. You know that scene in Harry Potter when he's scared to face Voldemort because he knows he has to let Voldemort kill him? Like, whoa, spoiler alert, Pio. And he turns to the ghosts of his parents and his uncle, and they all have Harry's back. I, I know this shit that I'm doing. It's not life or death. It's just a book. It's just, it's just a book. But it's that feeling of having wind at your back and a damn good rudder for the bumpy seas that are no doubt ahead. I have a lot of work to do with a real short runway to do it in. I have to continue my research and write a first draft by April 2024, aiming for a spring 2025 release for a major anniversary. And as I bring this meandering parting shot to a close here, it's also because of you that this even happened. The fact that you tune in and you download the show and you've helped grow it and leave reviews, you've helped secure that coveted platform that made me more attractive to invest in and take a flyer on there's a lot of room to grow still i'd love to see the show keep doing its thing just keep on keep on showing up drip by drip but without the pot and without without you guys listening i i'm not sure this comes together the way it did and all it took was 10 years so stay wild cnfers and if you can do interview see ya